So uh, great, we are recording. And then I'm going to post a little bit uh, of just an agenda to keep us, you know, sort of on on time. So it'll be in the chat box if everyone's familiar with the chat uh, box. I'll just po post that to kind of keep us a little bit on task. Uh, and and we are ready to start. So welcome everybody. I do a, it's sort of like a, a another welcome for the folks that were on early. Pardon. Uh, I am so excited everyone's here. Uh, I, uh, my name is Ed Reggie and I'm on, it doesn't say that probably, it just probably says AIN. So I'm, I'm logged on on the official AIN account on Zoom so we could record this. These are a series of our webinars that we've been doing uh, for the last year. And uh, I'm on the board and excited to sort of co-host this uh, with the, the wonderful Christiana Frank. Wonderful. Who's also on. Christiana, maybe you can introduce yourself. Um, I'm Christiana, and uh, let's see, I've um, been doing this since 1999 in education, and just recently in the last uh, five or six years, have been working more in mental health and medical, and also doing a lot of like more corporate kind of connections, so. Excellent. Yeah. Maybe we could go around and, and have folks introduce themselves and maybe where you're based out of uh, or the kind of areas that you do the work, uh, the applied improv work you're doing. Anyone want to jump in there first? Sure, sure. I'll, ju I'll jump in. <laughs> Thank Great. you both for doing this. Um, hi, my name is Lauren and I teach at Marywood University in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, I taught high school for a few years before coming to Marywood. Um, I also taught at Syracuse, New York at the university there for a couple of years. And I use applied improv with college students and with high school students. Uh, have not done any with middle or younger just yet. Uh, maybe someday, <laughs> but right now just mostly college and high school. Excellent. Anybody want to jump in there next? I'll jump in. I'm Jill. <laughs> I'm from New York. Uh, I teach improv and theater in and out of the classroom, and I'm here today with my colleague, Sarah. We work for a program called Funny Girls uh, that is based in New York City, and what we do is we do site visits to our instructors that are using applied improv to teach girls in grades three through eight leadership skills. So we are both teachers as well, but we are coaches looking in on their instruction. Excellent. Thanks, Jill. And Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can I can jump in quickly. I, I don't have much to add. I think Jill did a great job uh, covering what we do, but um, I'm Sarah. I'm, I'm saving you all from, uh, I'm a little sick right now, so I'm saving you all from the video, um, but from the Bay Area, so it's nice to hear somebody's out there in Reno right now. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Excellent. We're just doing introductions for those people that jumped on, so uh, feel free to anyone want to jump in there. We have... Hi. Oh, great. Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Ressler from California State University. I'm in Bakersfield and I teach um, all different kinds of things, mostly theater education. And I'm really interested in this ed because um, I'm about to embark on a research project with some uh, chemistry and science teachers to build community uh, with uh, the scientists there. Excellent. Thanks, Amy. Hi, this is Nancy Weaver. I am on a video mute. Uh, I'm from St. Louis. I'm a professor at St. Louis University and I serve as associate dean there in the College for Public Health and Social Justice um, and mostly use improvisation in my um, graduate student training and then also in a lot of the um, programs we develop and evaluate um, that are advancing a multitude of things. I work mostly right now in the areas of parenting. Excellent. Good to see you, Nancy. Well, not see you, but hear you. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't want to see me right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Any other introductions? Uh, I Hi, I'm Carolyn. Hello. Oh, oh. Uh, I'm at University of Toronto. I teach physics. Um, I previously taught at uh, Westchester University, so shout out to Scranton. Um, uh, I, I, although it does say grades you like to teach, and I love teaching like the eight to 12 year olds, even though I've never done that in a professional capacity. That's where it's really fun to like this part. Excellent. Thanks, Carolyn. 
Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Saul Hart. I'm at University of Michigan. Uh, I do science and environmental communication and uh, I started using improv <laughs> to teach um, actual course content in my class. Excellent. Maybe a little bit, uh, just, a, just a general Zoom, uh, the sensitivity of audio. So if you're not talking, just kind of quickly mute and then unmute. I'll help you if, I, if you're talking and I'll let, remind you to unmute if you jump on. Uh, so any other uh, introductions? Introductions, anyone else want to jump in there? I know some folks just jumped Hi, in. can you hear me now? I can. Can yeah. you hear me? Hi, yep. this is Catherine Kazmier. <laughs> I'm in Southern California. Um, I started a nonprofit in 2005, originally working with Boal Theater of the Oppressed um, and have been doing AI. We work in middle schools and high schools for the most part, drug and alcohol prevention, inclusion, diversity, mental health and well-being. Excellent. And remind me your name again. Catherine Kazmier. Catherine, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Hello. Can, I, can everyone hear me? Jonathan, we can hear you. Hello there. This is Jonathan Garland. Uh, I am calling from St. Louis, Missouri. And um, just real quick, I've um, been, I've used uh, I've had the uh, pleasure of using some improv, working with children, uh, working with uh, a grief camp a couple of years here for uh, grieving children, ages like seven to twelve. Uh, I've also been involved with um, some sixth graders uh, doing uh, doing some improv, and most recently, um, as I embark on this uh, applied improv journey, uh, working with. Um, a group of nurses here in town, um, masters uh, program nurses, uh, on uh, better collaboration uh, and uh, yes and philosophy. So it's been really fun. So I'm hoping I learn some stuff here. Excellent. Thanks, Jonathan. Anyone else uh, want to jump in there? Uh, introduction. Oh, go. Thank you, Megan. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm a new freelance improv instructor looking to work with kids, seniors, vets, um, do some workshops with uh, couples in the community. And I also started my own business designing workshops utilizing improv, humor, mindfulness, and positive psychology. I'm a huge mental health advocate as both a trained therapist and a patient myself. So I am, I want to jump in and do as much as I can. And I'm so grateful to be part of this organization. And I look forward to hearing more about what you guys are doing. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. I think there's a few more that anyone else want to introduce themselves. Go. Yeah, me. Yep. Hi, guys. I'm Josh. <clears throat> I'm from. I'm originally from South Africa, but I have lived. I worked in Taiwan for about 19 years in education. I work at an elementary school. I teach uh, drama, English, and specifically ESL, English is a second language, or uh, as well as EFL, English is a foreign language. So that's maybe, basically my passion is, you know, um, second or third language acquisition. I think improv is really great there. That's, that's where I would like to learn more about and I can also share a little bit about that. Um, I also I'm kind of in on a crusade to make play in schools more to bring play back because <clears throat> research times are not enough and even teachers don't get enough of a break. You know, sometimes we have just a five minute break. You don't even have time to go to the bathroom. Um, so I would I, I'm happy to see these days all over the world schools are taking recess back and they they're expanding on recess and they're giving more play time um, and I've tremendously benefited from play in my life where it has healed some stuff that I was struggling with especially through my teenage years my father helped me back a year because I couldn't <clears throat> I couldn't adjust to school properly and um, I was sick and everything and he just took me out of school for a year and I just basically played for a year and healed and got better and thrived. So for me, a play is power and it's, I, I wanna, that's my passion, more play time. Thanks Josh for sharing that. 
Thank you. Uh, I think a few others jumped in there. I think Joe jumped in there. Uh, uh, introductions. Joe, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Joe Van Hecke. I'm uh, starting into applied improvisation, like coming from 10 years as a teacher, looking to just uh, get more ideas on how we can use all these skills and great stuff to uh, work in the classroom and also talk on uh, social and emotional learning. Excellent. Great, thanks, Joe. Anyone else want to introduce themselves? I think uh, I'm just making sure everyone had the opportunity. Uh, okay, uh, we're gonna, we'll move forward. Um, so we kind of set a little bit of an agenda, uh, and I think we sort of kind of said, and I, we heard some of it in the uh, in the introductions. Uh, you know, uh, are you going into the schools? Uh, was some of the prompts that we kind of put out there and and are you working with teachers and we heard some people already speak to that uh, Christiana do you want to speak to that or kind of prompt a little more for everyone? I, feel like I introduced myself properly. I mean I do you know I said hey I've been doing this since 1999 and that's pretty vague you know from a personal standpoint you know I can agree with your name popped off but my gentleman from Africa you know I grew up in the Reno Tahoe area. And as a youngster, I had a lot of trauma in my life. I lost my father at 13. And what happened is I became very internal on myself. And once I went through the arts and, you know, went to New York and did a lot of performing, I, I found how to express myself. And we know what that feels like as, as humans once you find that self-actualization. So people look at me and they go, oh my gosh, you must like the arts. You did Broadway, yada, yada. And it's really not about, I love the arts, but it's not about that, that outcome. It's the process of, of getting ready to do a show or the process of becoming that I really honed into. And then in 1999, I started a program called Kidscape Productions in New York City in an at-risk youth and worked on that, brought it back to Reno Tahoe. And I have a team of people that work for me under that. And I have another company team building and they work for me under that. And then I'm consulting now an education consultant and a mental health consultant. All, all of those things all at once are all providing what you're providing the same thing. We're providing the opportunities to different audiences to learn this methodology. I have a ton to learn, but I also think my forte right now is you know, improvisation with K through 12, because that's been something, and actually pre-K through 12, and that's been the biggest influx of what uh, I'm working with out here. And I thought I might be able to help you because I hear some folks saying, okay, I've got after school programs. Boy, have I gone through that. I don't see her face. Or was it Megan? Megan, are you doing that? Yeah, you know, boy, have I gone through that, trying to get the kids settled down and all these types of things. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know exactly where to start this conversation, except for to let you know, you know, is I'm open for a ton of qu whatever questions you have, I'll do the best I can. If I don't have those answers, I can get back to you on those answers. I can ask one of my team members or something of that nature. In my education realm, taking it away from like corporate connections or maybe mental health facilities in this applied improvisation in the classroom. Uh, my understanding is today we'd be focusing on bringing it in the classroom during the day mm -hmm. as and aligning it with what the schools are asking for, as well as, you know, the ideas of bringing it in after school and what that looks like and feels like. And, you know, I've, I've fallen down a lot on those issues and that's why I thought I could share with you if you had questions and I could go wow this is what worked or this is what didn't work with the understanding that every school district is going to be a bit different. Um, I'm mean, again I'm moving more like we're taking over a couple of different school districts and when I say taking over it's pretty bold but you know I'm working with a, a school district here in town in another school district where my idea is you know coming in contact with the kids is really great it has that power but if I can get this in the hands of the teachers and I can actually get that buy-in where they're implementing it during the day, during specific structured times, um, that's where I'm really gonna see the benefits in the kids because it's ongoing. It's not just me there two hours a week, every school year. It's something that's being implemented every day, at least at 15 minutes. Well, this is, so, a, good, this is a good transition. This is a good uh, kind of prompt. So what is working for, for everyone on the call 
exactly what what uh, what was brought up about what what is working in that school time in the classroom? Uh, can let's talk about that. What's working? Do we have anybody out there doing programs during the day during school time? I just applied to do that through the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. They do in school residencies and I noticed they don't have improv. So I, I applied and I'm waiting to hear um, back. So hopefully if I get an interview, that's a good way to get in. You, they go into every school in New Jersey. And that's through, um, I, I'm sorry, Megan, just to clarify, just so people, it's being recorded so people can know this. That, is that through the, a citywide or a statewide organization? It's NJPAC, so it's New Jersey Performing Arts Center in okay. Newark, but okay. it looks like it's statewide. Um, a school can hire them essentially to bring in people to do residencies in the yeah. school. So I sent my information and said improv is a great thing to be bringing yeah. because it's sustainable and it's so important in the classroom. So Yeah, and, and I would say just to kind of share this with everybody for information, I know I'm on my state approved, like every state has an approved artist roster. Uh, and it has a lot to do with legalities and the schools can directly bring those people in. And a lot of artists, the teaching artists don't know, don't, don't know that. I think actually a lot of improv artists don't know that because actually in the fine arts and music, they all know that. And when I learned about that 10 years ago, that opens you up to a huge, I know in the state of Missouri where I live, uh, you know, just by being on that list, I have a huge amount of districts that contact me. So I would recommend for everyone to kind of like investigate your state. Uh, now, cities also have rosters, uh, larger cities do, but uh, for sure, most states have a artist roster, a residency, some kind of program. And uh, Megan, that's really great that you're pursuing that. Thank you so much for letting us know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, most states, I would say the majority of them do, yeah. And, yeah. and, and you don't have to live in a state, sorry to interrupt. You can actually uh, work to get on a state's roster when you are uh, not in that state as well, so. I was gonna, just to add on to, to yes and that, like the, the idea is, I've never really, for me personally, I've never really gone that route. What I've done is I've put on the hat of the person I'm working with. So when other places have brought us in and said, hey, do you wanna be you know, a performing artist or, or what not to come in our district, I said, mm, I'm gonna be a life skills person. And when folks offer theater space, I asked to be in the classroom. When they offer a space even outside, more and more with the educational side going, I don't want to be in the theater. That's setting up an idea where I'm having a more difficult time explaining the difference between comedy and improv and what this can do educationally. So a little bit hard available in great space and I love the theaters, but I find myself in classrooms with the kids in their rooms during the day. So it can be looked at, you know, in my life, I would love to see in my lifetime that this is core content, that social skills and speaking skills are core content. And I hope I see that while we're still alive, while I'm still alive. <laughs> um, but that's kind of my, how I frame things when I go into the district is going, you know what, this isn't, you know, it's got that performing art flair, but this is a life skills class. And that seems to help me open up a little bit more doors. And then with the work too, and with this social emotional, I think Joe was talking about the social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe, can you speak to that a little bit more, like what you're doing out there, or what you're seeing? Yeah, I, I am <laughs> really just at the the base of the the mountain, starting my uh, sorry, S starting my journey on this. Um, so really, I'm still working on developing content and um, trying to meet the, meet the right people to get in and explain this is, and I like, Christiana, the, the term you use, uh, this is life skills. This is not drama because as soon as you start pitching it, I feel like my experience has been that I might think, well, aren't they getting those in speech and drama? Well, the speech and drama kids are, but that's what, a fourth of your class? So that's what I'm interested in is like more ideas of like, okay, how do we sell and pitch this? And how do we find those people that we need to talk to in the schools or in the districts? Um, hi, this is Catherine. Um, 
my nonprofit, we contract with all the school districts in our county and with the County Office of Ed. We're contracting through TUPE, which is Tobacco Use Prevention Education. So they're state funds for drug and alcohol prevention, but their focus is not just on don't make kids smoke. It's on get, ag- letting kids learn how to be advocates and um, developing social emotional learning. So we're able to work in middle schools and high schools. Um, and our issue here is more like we want more, more content. We want to learn more, you know, what do we do? Because we have a lot of opportunities and I'd be happy to talk with people, you know, outside of this conversation, if they want help about how to, how to get into the schools through that route. I mean, we could even talk about that a little bit today, if that makes sense to you right now, I think. What do you think, Ed? Uh, let's keep hearing. I mean, let's circle back. Any other people that have had success getting into schools? Uh, just to kind of, yeah, Megan. Well, I also um, introduced pilot programs in some of the schools where I live, which is a nice way to get in, <laughs> giving free. I also have training in school counseling, which helps. So which that, helps. But what I learned from that is that, you know, every school has competencies social and emotional ones and if you can speak to those and, and show them how applied improv fits in that and and kind of go from there it's kind of speaking in the school language mm-hmm. you know what it, what is why are these kids going to benefit from this because mm-hmm. they have to go under those core competencies so that helps I go ahead and share from one of my um companies this is one of my first assessments i did for this uh for social emotional for k and for grades seven through 12, gifted and talented. But it just gave me the opportunity. I'm not gonna say it's my best right. My interns write this up, but the facts are the facts and you'll see some graphs. We did a before and after. But again, I'm not an assessment expert. So that might be helpful for some wording. Were you, were, are you sharing something, Christiana? Like, I just shared it from me. Uh, are you sharing a screen or are you sharing? I'm oh, not, no, I oh, there it is. I see it. I see it. It just came there. There it Yeah, is. just for later. And then, you know, I'm doing some more assessments on this, but that's the thing. I'm hoping everyone starts doing, you know, some types of assessments. So when we go, you know, we look this, you know, we've got more saturation of that information. Yeah. I, <clears throat> uh, this is Nancy from St. Louis. Um, I would love to be engaged in that assessment piece. Um, I don't have uh, necessarily, uh, I don't have a, a counseling or theater background, but um, in my public health work, that's, that's kind of my forte, the, the, the development and evaluation of um, kind of conceptual models of why things like this work. And then measuring the impact that they have not only in outcome but in terms of process and pairing that with um, kind of studies of context so um, in which schools will these kind of things work better Um, you guys have mentioned really excellent avenues for engaging with these populations so um, what are the features of organizations that um, allow us to gain and entry and traction with these kinds of things, what kind of data are most persuasive in making these competency arguments. Um, so if anybody is interested in jumping down that program evaluation or assessment route, that, that's, that's kind of my area of expertise and what, what I'm really excited to kind of uh, start linking that with some of the applied work that we're doing. Nancy, that would be great to uh, share your, you know, the best way to reach you in the chat box so people could, you know, copy and paste that. And, you know, we'll mention that, you know, when we post that uh, video too, as well. That's a, great, that's a great opportunity, everyone there to uh, take Nancy up on that. Because uh, that is very important. That's very important. Sorry, Christian. I interrupted you and I apologize. Nancy, are you suggesting that you're looking for kids to assess? You have that group of kids to assess. I do not have the group of kids, but I have... Um, uh, expertise in measurement and program evaluation. So I would be happy, I mean, in simplistic terms, um, agreeing on a set of metrics we're using for evaluation. So when you're doing pre and post tests, um, are we all using the same kind of instrumentation? In that case, we can really make a broader case for impact. Are we all, um, you know, are we all looking at, um, I mean, I guess simply put, it's, it's good to know 
how these programs work, why they work, for whom they work, in what settings they work. So when we go making the case for them, we have a broad base of data we can do that. And if we agree and we use the same kind of data, data capturing methods, then we have a stronger, um, a stronger um, base of evidence. Well, I'll let you know that I'm, you know, currently there's a couple of needs I'm seeing in the education industry and I'm going to post it here. It's pretty specific. So this is something I'm, I'm actually looking for. And then I will let anyone out there know, and I think this would benefit everyone doing it to have this information. Um, but if anybody is looking for kids or Nancy, you are looking for kids. My team works with 1500 kids a week, nine months out of the year. And so we have ongoing and new going kids where we can provide that platform. Oh, I think, I think we may have, you know, Christiana, your uh, signal, your uh, internet is uh, kind of going up and down. So we're losing you. Oh, you are. Let me turn yeah. off some things. Yeah. What are we doing yeah. now? Uh, it's good now. Joe, you had your hand up there. Yeah, thanks. Um, I am working with a group of 26 homeschoolers uh, right now. So if there's some assessments, uh, like a post assessment that anybody's using that they'd want to share that I could gather some data, and then I'd be more than willing to share my findings with them. I think I've got one, two, three, maybe four at the most weeks left with, with that program that I'm working with. It sounds to me, uh, just from hearing the conversation right now that there could be some really great traction in, in if there isn't a post uh, pre or post, you know, evaluation survey that, that specifically uh, goes after this sort of applied improvisation um, that maybe there should be help in some creation of that, that we could start to use and share. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that's, a, that's what I'm hearing. So. On that link um, that I put to everyone, that Kidscape Productions link, you'll see a pre and post question assessment that I did. Mm -hmm. but I, I will say this for the last time, I guess. My concern is, is that it's not 100% because I've not done assessments, but I decided to post it because it was giving traction for my clients to go, oh, look, I'm seeing, you know, they needed to see something. So I posted it for folks to use, but please be mindful to read through it first. Yeah. It could be a good starting spot, you know, good start, leap, you know, leaping off that. Absolutely. And you know what? I'm sorry, I don't see the hand up button and I feel like I'm interrupting people. Where's the it, Zoom raise you know, it, it's, there is a, it's a, on Zoom there is a, are you on phone too? It depends on if you're on phone or not. Uh, it, it's okay, Nancy, you're doing great. <laughs> one, one thing we might think about doing is, um, I mean, I'm an academic and I think about papers and grants all the time, but, you know, there might be a mechanism if we all wanted to partner um, and test some of these instruments, uh, we could apply for some funding to do some work thinking about how we examine the impact of these programs. So that would be a really, I mean, many of you are mentioning that you have opportunities to survey kids. Um, and I'm happy to kind of serve as a repository of instruments or data um, and that kind of thing. So to the extent that I can be a resource for any of that broadly, I'm happy to, to think about kind of next steps. That's great. Well, um, I think maybe just sort of, I'm looking at the time trying to keep our agenda moving forward. You know, I'm sort of the stage manager in me a little bit too. Um, we talked about, you know, the idea of getting into classrooms. We've moved in, into some survey and some evaluation work, which is really important, I think, for sure. Um, how, maybe some conversation around, uh, you know, relationship with teachers, uh, your interactions with you, success stories with teachers failures with te you know when things didn't work anybody have anything they want to speak to that i think that was sort of a really could be an interesting uh, direction i i can speak to that if nobody wants to start sure. do you have any questions in that area sure why don't you give a good framing like any success stories or when it didn't work, <laughs> maybe, well, you, know. Got, you know, I'm so focused on it being uh, at that serious activity during the day. Um, I did start for many years doing the after school and I can understand what Megan means. I mean, after school is a different situation. The kids mindsets are different, you know, but during the day, the buy-in for the teachers, I mean, 
All I hear from teachers is I don't have time for one more thing. I just don't have time for one more thing. And you see them. And then my friend down, I'm sorry, it just says you're on your iPhone, but you're saying you don't have time to go pee. I get it. I'm tired of, you know, there's just so much going on in those and there's so much happening, you know, so what I do is I go in and, you know, find out what the teacher's need is. Now, whether I'm working in a GT situation with twice exceptional kids, they're called 2E kids, or, you know, whatever background of the, the group I'm working with, I design it for the teacher and I really try to get that buy-in going, look, I'm going to teach you how to implement this in two to 10 minutes. So two minutes being maybe a circle warm-up game. And that's a little bit, I'm being a little bit bold saying that. So, you know, for a newer teacher, it's going to be like 10 minutes for that warm-up game for them to figure it out. And then maybe for, I call it a core content game, it'll be 15 minutes. But with that being said is I do that buy-in and go, look, I'm going to, we either do a teacher training, a full district, or we do a, a, a school teacher training. I run them through the applications, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't fit into their classroom as well unless you go in there and do some in-class modeling. And I will tell you, since over the years, my classroom management, I'm actually getting hired outside of the improv realm just to come in with classroom management but I'm using improv for classroom management. The, the education is just seeing it a little bit differently. So then I'm in a classroom and I get that buy-in showing them, hey, look, you don't need manuals. You don't need to open up stuff. You know, I have a little bullet point so they can glance down and follow the steps. But then in about five, let's be fair, five to seven minutes, they're able to get the kids up to do an activity. And now once you have your kids up there to do the activity, I'm telling the teacher, First of all, we know it's best to be engaged with your kids, but this gives you the opportunity to stand back, watch what they're doing, and if you debrief, it's all in the debrief, right, Ed? It's all in the debrief. <laughs> but if you debrief appropriately and you're take and you're really paying attention, you're able to analyze the core content retention, the social emotional learning, the executive functioning, the metacognition. I mean, you're able, the trauma informed approach is the new thing too in education. And while I can't go in with my companies and go, we're in line with trauma informed and here's all the steps, we're an amazing enhancement tool. Because if I've got a kid in trauma or having problems with social skills, and you're giving them books or brains to color so they can learn how their brain works, you know, we all get that that's it's a step you can do, but let's get the kids up and then the rest of the stuff that you know. I mean, we're actually doing and we're actually observing them in their atmosphere. And if the debrief part is the most important, if debriefed correctly with the student and with the teacher, the understanding is there and the value is there. I am, uh, when the decision makers are in the room just for my horse and pony show, you know, I make sure that I have that debrief in place when the decision makers are in the room so they can actually see the value. Because I'll get the decision makers walking in and it might be a fun time where we're all laughing and then they walk away going, oh, goofy gameplay for children, you know? And while it is for the kids right now, I'm trying to design in my community that this is not just a child's game. This is building a healthy brain. This is building neural pathways. Joe, did you want, I mean, you had, uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but you definitely have a. Uh, I was just, uh, uh, yeah, as I'm yeah. listening to Christiana speak, um, I just stepped away from uh, my high school teaching position of over uh, just roughly 10 years in a uh, high needs cl uh, classroom environment. And everything that we're saying here is just speaking my language. And that's what I was trying to convince my principal and my administration team and everybody. And I, I had a class for leadership and it went pretty well, but I couldn't get buy-in from students the next year. So it just kind of fell off the map. And, and my frustration was like, this is important stuff. This is more important than learning how to analyze a complex character or find a theme in a short story. And now I'm branching out on my own, going to businesses and hopefully schools to convince them, look, here I am, let's do this together. So thank you for some, some of that language that I just heard and just like, yeah, that's really speaking to me right now. Yeah, it, 
Um, just to speak to that too, uh, I have to close my eyes to find my brain. Just to speak to, it's early for me, I've been up so, so early. It's just to speak to that too. I have found it a lot easier. And now I've got kind of a toxic school district where I'm at that's a fear-based system going out here. It's not good. So this might just be for me in my location. But I really suggest looking into those charter schools, the private schools, the Catholic schools, where the decisions are made a little, it, it's not as complicated mm -hmm. and there's not as many much red tape to get through and to align your situation with their mission statement. You know, for my Catholic schools, I know here we're talking about SEL, social emotional learning, and you can find out more on Castle. For my Catholic schools, they have SLE, school learning environments. So what I did was I said, look, we're gonna put these, it's this kindness respect type of deal, and I'm gonna put these into the program. And I've also given away a ton of free stuff. You know, let me come into your classroom. My issue and what I need to get better is, is at explaining it. I mean, I know I'm on here to help you, guys, but my issue is getting better at explaining it to folks for that buy-in, right? And we're still trying to get that evidence out. But once I get into that room, and Joe, my favorite is the kids with the hard knocks for a lack of, lack of better wording, because that's where oh, I come from. Definitely. I come from telling a teacher to get lost. I come from being asked to go to juvie, juvenile detention and me going, okay. You know, so that was just, I had a really bit of a challenge growing up, wasn't engaged with material. And that's why my passion is going, let's get these kids engaged with their material so they can do it once. But to circle back, going into the classroom and going, give me 30 minutes, give me 45 minutes. But now in the classroom, this isn't an after school environment where you maybe have 15, 20 kids registered. Here you're looking at, in some of my classrooms, my staff works with 45 kids at 45 minutes. And they'll start at 9 a.m. and they'll go nine to 10 or whatever, a little break, nine, 10, 10. And they'll be at a school all day going 45 kids, 35 kids, 40, and it's a lot. And so then I had to get back to the drawing board with my curriculum folks and go, and it's mainly me as a curriculum folk, we're not that big. So it's me and a couple other people and I'll design these applications so it almost splits the class in half, right? So one class does an act, one half, we debrief, switch. I don't let these kids, I have to act everything out. I don't let these kids on stage if they've been watching until they can recall and reflect and understand and attach what they saw up here. So then we show that value statement, we switch. In those situations, it's very like, ah, we have to go super quick. Technically, I don't, or, or usually I don't do those warm up games. Sometimes we just go in for those core content games or the social emotional learning games. Um, but embedding to Joe, embedding, and for everyone, embedding that classroom management strategy into the class into your applications has seemed to be a huge win for us or for me because teachers go wow you're you know you know the what the school wants for classroom management you're you're following our guidelines oh my gosh you you're using my language and especially when i start using their language they go oh and then i kind of go gosh it's the same thing it's just a different word but if I say social emotional learning instead of social skills, they're buying in. If I don't talk about mental health, but I say trauma informed, it's the same thing, but they go, oh, well now we want you because it's trauma informed. Well, this, this is a great, another good segue because how many of us in this, in this webinar here, this conference uh, meeting are trained officially trained, you know, have either an education degree or an EDD or something in that sense. And I only say that not to sort of separate us, but to sort of speak to your point that you're raising is that sometimes the language can be a barrier once we're in the classroom. So we, let's just pretend we got in the classroom, now we're there. And if we're speaking, uh, I'm going to say theatrical terms, improv terms, and not speaking the lexicon, we may not come back. Right. So uh, I, I want to sort of bring that up. Anyone can anyone resonate to that? Just to putting that out there, or feedback or response. Anyone else? I know Amy, you're in. Uh, you you have probably a PhD. Am I correct, or did I just give you a higher degree? 
<laughs> oh, you're muted. You're you're muted, Amy. Mm -hmm. and, oh, I'm almost done with the EDD, actually. Oh, that's what I thought. I know you were. So yes. several of you knew here, probably Joe, you also obviously were trained officially academically in education. Yes. So uh, the, that, for the, both of you, that probably, what, what is your sense? And I'm, I'm sure there are others. I just happen to know. Is that something, a barrier that, that once we're in the classroom and we're not, when I say we, the facilitators, aren't speaking that language necessarily? I think it depends on where you are. And we call it different things in different places. Um, and that does make a difference. Uh, but, you know, if, in my experience, if you, if you come to an agreement about what it is that we're actually talking about right, right off the bat, then those monikers don't necessarily have to be a barrier um, as long as you, know, you, you hit that first and, and uh, make an agreement about what it is we're actually trying to accomplish. So sort of establishing on the onset what, what the goals are. Yeah. Almost going back to that, that you know, why we're in that room. Uh, sort of speaking to what, what, you know, the goals of the students, the goals of the teacher. And, you know, when, when we brought up the teacher part of this uh, agenda, I also think there's a lot of, uh, when I work in, in, in district, school districts, you know, I found a lot of my work has shifted uh, in the last almost 20 years in this space from working directly with students where now I'm doing professional development. I'm in the classroom, but I'm hired to coach the teacher and I model the, the lessons first uh, for a series of weeks. And then I stay in the classroom and then I watch and support them. So part of my uh, being in their literally contract is that I, I do it for 30 minutes and then I'm also with the teacher alone for 30 minutes after, right after it. And then we have a goal. I'm, I'm, I'm supporting her or him so that I could leave and they can do it. And I'm finding more success in, in that kind of, uh, for me personally, I'm not saying industry, I'm saying for me personally, so that staff using this AI applied improv as a professional development for, for you know, to be blunt. And I, to speak to that, I really feel that that's important. I think that's what's helping get the buy-in over in my area too, is getting just the tools into the hands of the teachers and letting them go. Um, and the biggest, I, I'm worst case scenario person and not to be negative, but I always walk into a situation going, what can go wrong so I can front load the, what my fix to it. Uh, but again, is what I'm finding is when I teach the teachers outside of the classroom, they have a very complicated time working with the classroom management skills around the free play and keeping the kids organized without just freaking out. And then what happens is the principal will come in and go, this just looks goofy or this doesn't. So getting them the information either in the classroom or before, but then hanging with them. I really like what Ed, I have never, which I need to, is gone with the individual teacher by themselves after the class to debrief. And I am going to effectively make that an option starting today because that just spoke to a teacher last week who goes, I'm just so overwhelmed. And she wasn't overwhelmed with our stuff. She was just 35 kids, you know, police in the school I was working in and just a lot of stuff going on, but she wasn't able to focus on it. And Ed, that 30 minutes with her would have really seemed that gap. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it could vary. Sometimes it's 15, 20. And, but to build it in, the contract, like, so it's, it's a commitment. And I just, you know, to say that this is, you, in other words, if you don't do that, then they might have to stay in the classroom with the students and you can't work with them separately, privately, in a side room. So when you build it in, then some other teacher has to come in there and aid or somebody has to be with the classroom for that 15 to 30 minutes. So we could debrief on what happened, what didn't happen, did we reach our goals? I think it's really valuable. If you're doing any kind of professional development uh, in, in, you, in this space with classrooms, and I do it literally pre-K all the way up to high school, that, that model. Hey, Ed, can I ask you, do you do uh, written follow-ups when you, because that's a big thing that we do. So why after school staff does written follow-ups and it goes out to all the parents and, um, and I have somebody doing that, that would drive me crazy. Uh, but 
also I do my own follow-ups for the teacher training. And do you do this too? And I just found that there's value because I can throw in that key wording and then they have something to put, you know, for their follow-ups. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 for me personally, I always go back to aligning all the programs I'm doing aligned to the state, the standards that they want to be teaching. So if I'm going in a science room or English classroom or history, whatever the block they're giving me, so that content will be, I'm always aligning to state standards that the teacher needs to do, always. And I'm also re uh, relating to standards around drama, movement. I mean, there, there are so many standards. Every one of us can pull standards out of applied improv in many different areas in your state standards. So I just pull out the popular ones and I'm always connecting each lesson back to how we're moving towards those lessons, those standards. So with my follow-up to, and I think this answers your question, it's always connecting to, I'm trying to scaffold the, the teacher and the students towards meeting both the art, the arts, and for me it's, character ed arts standards, which is applied improv, I'm simplifying it. And then the other standards that they need to know. And if it's for K through, uh, let's say elementary six, it's gonna be literacy, it's gonna be communication, all those ones that we, we know. But that's, how, that's my follow up. It always gets anchored back into what our agreement was. To Amy's point, it's always what the goal is why I'm coming in the classroom. It's always gonna be anchored, Megan. Who is the contract with? I'm just curious. The contract is always, in my case, with the district, because the district, in essence, if even as, if it's Catholic schools, it's going to be the archdiocese. So it's, okay. it's the larger entity that has, you know, kind of knows the work I'm doing. And then I have buy-in. I have found, this is, diff this is just for me, I have found that if I have buy-in at the highest level, uh, superintendents, principals, I'm going to have buy-in. I may not have total buy-in with the teachers yet, but, uh, but generally speaking, if I have only teacher buy-in, in my experience, then I may have a short-lived program or I'm not going to have, they're not going to be supported at the district. So I fight and advocate and literally knock on the doors of the super, super districts and sell my work to the districts. And they all do PD. Every district has to do PD work so that's where I'm first seeing, I give free stuff at the, at the district level. And then I get, I kind of, I kind of uh, do my, uh, you know, conversation around the work I'm doing, that we're all doing, that we've all spoke to. So I try to get buying in at a higher level. Uh, and then this way it's a little easier. So that's, that's where the contract is. Thank you. This is Catherine um, Kezer. I would say too, working with the districts and speaking to that, like what language do we use and how do we connect? Once I got in the door a little bit with um, prevention, I started going to anytime there's a, a district training for teachers, something around um, restorative justice or social emotional learning or, uh, you know, I'm finding all those buzzwords and, and what is it that they're training on trauma informed care, then I go down that rabbit hole and I learn more about it and I'm in these sessions with you know, I, I go to sessions that I didn't necessarily have to go to because that's where I connect with the other people there. And, and throughout their training on whatever it is, my mind is just popping with all the ways that the kind of work we do would connect and support these teachers. So we become a resource for teachers around a whole bunch of different topics and bringing it in and helping them learn how do they bring it alive? How do they engage? Um, so um, I guess my point is like learn all those languages and, and be, keep looking for those holes. And once you're doing one thing, then they respect you. So once I have a team of nine now, and so we're out there and, and we'll do a, something around one topic, but um, now, now we've built up that reputation that we have the opportunity to, that they say, well, what about this? Or what could we do for that? So um, learning their language. And I guess more than just learning to speak it, like really learning to understand it. So you know how to apply it. Thanks for that. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Anyone else around this idea of, you know, we're, we're still in that space. We, we're, we have good time and we're going to open it up then for maybe some specifics to, you know, we're, um, it's forever stage manager me to kind of keep us on task, you know, but uh, Megan. 
Yes, sorry. I don't mean to no, keep no. it. <laughs> but I guess one idea I had, and I don't know if anybody does this, um, especially because I have the school counselor training. An idea that I'd like to work on would be doing well educator trainings for teachers' well being and school counselors that they would get credits for attending these trainings. So they, they could be offered in conferences where it would benefit them as professionals and they. Is it CEUs? I'm, yeah. I'm blanking on the right. Yep. Yep. Continuing education unit. Yeah. I could say that I've been fairly successful with that at two universities uh, in St. Louis where I live. Uh, it's going to the, go to universities that have teaching programs. They're very, they're, you know, cranking out teachers in a very successful way mm -hmm. and uh, speak to them, pitch an idea. I, I've done that. And, and, it's been successful to kind of do some applied improv. You may not be able to do a series of, of classes, but definitely some intensive, some workshop, three hour, four hour PD. Uh, and maybe anyone else has done that in, in this room? Yep, Lauren. Let me unmute myself here. Uh, yeah, so just to speak to that point, Megan. So I, I actually found an inroad through working with pre-service teachers who were gonna, be, gonna become English language arts teachers through an English ed program at Stony Brook University and worked with them over the course of several semesters. So sometimes it would be like a one-off workshop. Sometimes it would be an extended series, but by working with them, it also partnered, gave me an opportunity to partner with local high schools and middle schools because the teacher education programs were also doing this to benefit their students. And once they could see that this training was benefit their future teachers and therefore their future students, I was able to work with some of the nonprofits in the area that were bringing in either middle schools or high schools to the university, let's say, who maybe might be the first generation uh, members of their family to go to college. So it actually opened up the door by working with some of them. And a lot of them had the infrastructure to do a lot of these connections. So it was a great way to sort of learn about what their pre-service teacher needs are and what they're currently doing and then where I could fit in and start doing, I started doing some workshops with a project called the Living, Living Book Project mm -hmm. at Stony Brook University, just by going into their pre-service courses and just doing a one-off workshop, but it, it led to something long-term. So that was a good opportunity, yeah. Thanks Lauren, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Any, yep, Amy. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to point out that um, in my experience, um, something that is, is oftentimes a roadblock is how much um, different areas of the curriculum or different areas of, of study are such silos. And um, people don't know from one, um, from one field to the next what is possible and they call it different things which is, you know, takes us back to the idea of making sure that you, that you understand what your purposes are to begin with. Um, I recently, I, I caught wind just by accident of a project that was going on, about to go happen in the um, science college at the university where I teach. And that's a completely different college. We don't have meetings together. They have a different dean, all that. I happened to just catch that. And so on a whim, I sent an email to the person who's in charge of this grant to see if they would be interested in using um, AI to accomplish their goals, which are community building and um, understanding in the sciences. Um, and that's just one example. I mean, there I've done workshops for uh, nursing training that has been very, very uh, well accepted and um, for people who work with, uh, with caregivers of Alzheimer's and that's been very well accepted. But sometimes you need to just, you know, go outside of what your own expectations are and just go down the list and say, could I, I use it in this area? Could I use it in that area? You know, and then approach the people who are in there and you'd be surprised, I think, how often people sort of do a double take and say, you, you can do what? Why, this isn't theater, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. thank you, Amy. And I think you re that resonates that, uh, in my experience, again, at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, uh, they've been very, many universities, I'm gonna say, are very, they're, they're just excited about doing a workshop for teachers and especially existing current teachers to kind of get again a little professional development and especially in healthcare this is true with OTs PTs nurses uh, I have found that to be the case that they're, they're very excited very excited law and uh, criminal justice program oh sure I, I could I haven't done that space but I could see that uh, I think it's really there there especially in the education the, people are eager 
if you're coming in with some really uh, interesting tools and strategies. I think if you present it, uh, to go back to what Catherine was talking about, you know, it's going in there and knowing the individual industry language is very helpful. You don't have to be an expert, but I really think you're coming in there, we're all coming in with strategies. We're all coming in with ways to kind of really solve problems. And I find that that's usually my foot in the door. In fact, I sometimes never say the word improv at first, never. You know, it's, I, they're, 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 I'm setting up a meeting about strategies for teachers, for educators for you know, counselors, social workers. I do a lot of work at the Brown School. I offer it twice a year, uh, Washington University. And they're always receptive, always receptive. And you get a lot of teaching counselors. And it, when you're in a social worker kind of school, you'll get overlap in education as well. I, um, I was gonna speak to that uh, using the improv term. Um, we've been doing, we've been in the schools for 15 years and we're just now to the level where they have so much respect for all the different things that we do that we're letting out the secret that this is applied improvisation. So we're just now like starting to tie everybody's mind to realize that that's what we've been using so that we can kind of go further and deeper there. But yeah. um, yeah, we, we didn't, we have not, all our contracts were not improv contracts, although that's what we were really doing. Yes. In my world, we used to call it creative drama for years and years and years, and nobody seems to use that term anymore. That's like old school, but you know, it does take the fear of uh, improv out of it if you call it that. Yeah, I think it's that what I think Christiana said earlier on today, it's that, that worry of the, someone walking in, and a, a, an administrator, a supervisor, somebody, and seeing people, this is that they have it in their mind if they hear the word improv, they're just laughing in there. They're just doing comedy. And, and it, you know, even though the room could still be laughing and doing great work, it's something about that word that associates. So yeah, I, I, I think it's great that I use any word that will get me the, in the door, get me working with the teachers, like we've said. Is anybody else using any other wording? I mean, I hear strategies. I know I use life skills. I heard creative drama from Amy. Does anyone else use any other language that they can share? There are a lot of uh, grants out there that require a youth engagement component. So we use youth engagement, um, youth development. Love that. I think prof Another professional development, so sorry, didn't mean to interrupt anybody, but professional, just the term professional development, yeah. We have um, in, the, in, the, in the public health parlance, there's an approach called community-based participatory research. It's a long mouthful, we call it CBPR for short. It's a way of engaging communities and specifically youth in sort of the, the public health research enterprise. And so when we do stuff like this, sometimes we couch it in that language that it's a, it's a youth engagement strategy, but the engagement is for the express purpose of shaping a, a research uh, trajectory or answering a research question. I just had on the chat, uh, I think it's pronounced, is it uh, Katan said that in the UK well-being, uh, he shared, uh, they shared uh, well-being. And that's important for those, it is a global organization. So those watching this video, uh, once it's been recorded, uh, the language would be very, it could vary absolutely. I wanna be conscious of that. Sometimes I am so, you, you know, American focused, North American language. So uh, their, their language can change. Megan. I also think the word mindfulness is becoming very accepted in schools. And I think that improv ties into that exam. I mean, when I did school counseling and trying to um, convince people that playing during a session is just as important as getting to the meat of the issue. Um, but mindfulness, like I'm going all over the place, but social, my, I mean, improv games teach that kind of social mindfulness of listening to others, being socially supportive. Um, so I think that word can be helpful too, as it's being, and I think in UK, they, they're, adapt, they're putting mindfulness in all schools. If I'm reading that correctly. 
I, you know, to speak to that, to yes and you, and then um, authentic is really a good word that's been coming up for me in my sales. Just connecting authentically, radical self-acceptance is another one. You know, there's a great book out there right now on the New York Best, I, I don't know if it's still on there, but it's called The Obstacle is the Way. And I have a couple of my universities that have, have taken that book and they're reading The Obstacle is the Way. And on top of that, we're doing improv games for resiliency. So another approach too is entering into an educational system and going, you know, what are you learning? And then speak to that. And, you know, using your improv words and go, okay, you're reading in high school, reading the Odyssey. Well, great. I'm going to, you know, show you how to bring that to life or, or check for that core content. But they're doing that at our university right now around the obstacle is the way. And I haven't done the workshop yet. I do it next week. But I'm going to play some of the basic games for review. But then we're also going to talk about, you know, how you're building those. I'm going to talk. I'm really big into talking on the social brain. I'm really big into Matthew Lieberman. He's all over YouTube. And he, he, he speaks to that. Um, I think I just went off topic. <laughs> but he, he speaks to that. Whereas, you know, I can go into a gifted and talented situation right now in our high schools. And we all know that maybe they need it like those scientists to be able to, to speak a little bit more, but being able to differentiate the social brain, the analytical brain, and then show how they come together is also helping get that buy-in. But just to digress back to the, um, to the obstacle is the way, um, what a great book for resiliency. So if you're looking for a workshop for adults, you know, it's a great bouncing off point. Uh, I'm finding it, this university up here is just doing a great job with it, but we're bringing it to life. And now the decision maker comes in and says, oh, I see their retention on it. Oh, I see where they're going with it. And then my biggest question at everything at the end of anything I ever do is what did you learn? How are you going to apply it? And if you have to do nothing else in the debrief, I mean, I'm guessing all of you are debriefing on much deeper levels, but just if you don't have a minute, if you only have a second, what did you get? How will you apply it so they can connect that idea? That's, that's, that's great. Uh, any, you know, speaking of that, was there any other particular uh, resources, books, authors that we should be sharing. I love that you did that because I think that could be a good resource and this is being recorded. So anyone else in this specific education applied improv connection? One connection may be um, that schools are um, using technology in different ways and I predict that there will be a backlash on this but sort of with the one-to-one -one laptop programs um, I think schools are recognizing that that's decreasing social connection. And so to counterbalance that, they may be looking specifically for some of these types of programmings. I mean, even when you have students look each other in the eye, that becomes kind of uncomfortable. There's a good book that's called Irresistible, and it talks about sort of the addiction of technology. It's a nice kind of counterpoint to what we're doing, and it might help sort of set the stage for need. Mm. Mm. Irresistible. Um, and to yes and that just briefly is to um, we've got groups out here with that anxiety, um, self harming, and I'm having a bunch of teens that are speaking to that on a podcast that'll be coming up. And these kids came to me to tell their story, which was just so heartwarming. But their identification on what's going on with them is, you know, if you have your cell phone and you say some somebody says something you don't like, you can turn them off. You can set it down, you can turn it down <laughs> off. but now these kids are finding that they've been so, you know, working on their technology now that when they're having a face to face and if somebody says something they don't like, they can't handle it. They don't know how to process that information. And, you know, giving that simple yes and tool, of course, is going to be it's just radical change right there, but giving them that practice with that face to face. But the anxiety out here in one of my schools is so hard. We've got a lot of very sick kiddos too. Yeah. It's, speaking to that going, you know, getting their face out of the phone, getting their face out of the computer. The computer is beneficial. I'm not going to down it, but. I mean, even at the college level, the, the mental rates of mental health are just skyrocketing. We can't, we can't even yeah. keep up with it. We are in the last 25, I don't want to interrupt anyone's thought here. We could continue this, but we're in the last 
about 25 minutes of the official meetup here uh, time, uh, which being recorded. So I'd love to make sure we kind of put out if there's anyone else that had some questions specific, like maybe some real case situations that they need help with or recommendations. You know, it's the, I want to make sure we're, we're meeting all your needs. So anything else to put out this 25 minutes? Well, we'll keep we'll keep the conversation going here. Uh, let's. I just kind of and I just ended that conversation. That was what I did. <laughs> but you know, well, I want to bring up something. I I you know just to kind of kind of get back in this conversation. I just read something this morning. I think it was the New York Times, but it could have been the. I get various ones on my morning digital iPad, which is ironic because it said that we keep using the term millennials, not we, the folks on this phone call, but people in the media, reporters, journalism, newspapers, and the Gen Z, what they found is, which is the younger uh, students in school right now, uh, some have graduated college, they're in college, that youngest of young, they're not so interested in being connected to a screen. In fact, the data is now showing they are less likely, they're turned off by constant text messaging. And so this, especially the younger uh, Gen Z, so uh, there's potential uh, for AI, I think, with turning on this elementary, this, and I see it with the, the new third graders, fourth graders, the ones I'm working with, it, they're very different and they really connect, they, they, they connect to each other in a different way. So I'm, I'm hopeful, it's like a cycle. Do you think that's just because they don't have phones yet, Ed, or do you think? No, it's actually the reverse. The article said, the data says okay. that they've been so overwhelmed and their parents are either older millennials or younger, you know, or, or young Gen Xs, Gen Xers, okay. but they're so overwhelmed with the everything. They've never watched a TV on TV. That's all been what they wanted on demand when they want. We're talking at the early state age of two, they could do anything they want. And they just don't, it's like they're over, they're, turned, they're turning it off. They're in control a little bit more. They're overstimulated. Well, that, that gives me hope. I've got a, a freshman and a, a sixth yeah. grader and it, prying that phone out of their hands is, is a struggle daily. So It is, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm a, also a summer camp director and recently did uh, a bunch of focus groups with campers from this camp. And one of the most interesting things was uh, when I asked them, you know, what, what are your favorite things about camp? So many of them said they, they feel such a sense of relief when they have to give up their phone. Nobody's allowed to have electronic devices at camp. You know, and they said, I feel like, oh, I'm free, I'm free. Mo many of them said that. Yeah, which I think I say it in the context of this, this, this all of our conversation. I think this is a great opportunity. And I really do mean this. I think that... Uh, it's going to be a plus. Uh, it's going to be a struggle, of course, because of that one-on-one, -on -one, one laptop per child kind of approach that's been in the system or one tablet. But I think, uh, I think I'm hopeful because I think it's a, a way to connect. I think teachers are, are going to be uh, wanting ways to connect uh, back to the in the live classroom situation, that one-on-one, -on -one, that empathy is going to kind of return a little bit to the classroom. I think that that also speaks to just the way teachers connect in the building. I mean, sometimes it's just easier to send an email to someone that's next door to you right. than to go face to face and just have that contact, which is mindfulness. I mean, that's just the way we are connecting with each other. It's not just slowing down our brains. It's how we mm -hmm. connect to each other when we go to the store, when we're at school, when we're at home, and just kind of building bridges and tying that all together, I think is so important. You know, for, for many years, I would work in the classroom and I would tell my team, I would go, you know, I feel like we could get paid just to sit here and watch kids and not be on our phone. And there was that whole generation that was just so hungry to be paid attention to. You know, now that I hear what Ed said, I'm going to look at that article. I don't know if you posted it, Ed. I'd like, I'm going to try to research that article because that's so hopeful. I mean, I facilitated a class last night for anxiety for adults and some teachers showed up and some folks from around town showed up. And I basically just said the statement, you know, we all know what it feels like when somebody's doing this and you're trying to connect or they're not yes anding you and what it feels like when you connect and you feel like you matter 
and you feel like everybody in that room is getting a turn and about four adults just started breaking down and crying. They're going, I don't feel like I matter. I'm not giving, I'm not remembering how to make that connection. And so I think with that, that group of youth too, I'm finding more and more of that, whether it's the self-harming group or what's happening, is there that connection um, of going and talking to that person, Megan, and not sending the text message or picking up the phone and not shooting the email or doing a live chat like this, you know, instead of, so yes, and I'm again. I'm so hopeful. What Ed said. That's the best news of the day. Yeah, well, it's it's a it's a start. We'll say that. I posted it. It was uh, I I saw it on a blog that reposted from somewhere else. So I I did post it in there. The article. Um, well, is there? I know Jonathan. I know you're listening, and several of you have been listening. Is there anyone else that wants to kind of, you know, Jonathan? I know you're working around a lot of with uh, uh uh, students that are grieving, uh, you know, and nurses. So I didn't know if there was anything you wanted to share or put out there. And it could be, he might be muted or frozen. It could be that too, which at that point we should all sing, let it go. Just kidding. <laughs> so, sorry. So, uh, so uh, anything else? Uh, I think the next steps, you don't want, uh, I, I think I, I had a little note of this to remind myself. Um, are there any conferences that are unrelated? Uh, obviously, we have the global AIN and regional and all these other chapter meetups, but, but is there anything in the education space would anyone recommend? Uh, I know we're coming to the end. I should have asked that in the beginning with when we had a lot more people, but uh, Amy, is there anything in the education space or anyone, Megan, that you would recommend uh, educational conferences that the people we should look at doing, going to? I know that the... Um... CASEL, C-A-S-E-L, has a, a couple of huge conferences. Uh, I'm unfortunately, due to schedule, I'm not able to go to any one of those. And um, something I'm involved in is the American Camping Association Education Conference uh, for, you know, the, those, of you, those of us who are involved in after school and out of school programs as well. Um, and the American Alliance for Theater and Education um, also has an interest group that is uh, about teaching drama and improv. Excellent, excellent. Anyone else wanna, you know, any kind of related, or it doesn't have to be just pure education. It could be the, the, the spaces of counseling that it would be great as an attendee, we could pick up more of that lexicon and language. Megan. School, counsel school counseling is a huge thing. And I often think school counselors get undervalued, so. As a person who's certified and couldn't find a job, I started my own business, but that's because I want to push the SEL stuff in the schools and you can't always do as much and be as creative with all the administrative sides. But school counselors are good, pers good people to connect with and um, they do a lot of work or we should, they should be doing, we should be doing work in the classroom, but it often gets pushed aside with other needs. That's great. That's a good, good, good to mention that. <laughs> feel that this might be things that are opening up. I, I don't, I think I can get away from the acronyms on my computer, but I will tell you that I'm seeing more of an influx of military kids. I've gotten a couple of folks asking me from the Virginia Military Institute, so I'll be presenting there, but I'm also looking locally. So um, we have a little veterans group that we run and uh, my husband's a vet, but out of that, there's all these, these grants and things going around for military kids. Um, if you're not going to be working with the vets, there is a, a, a thing called Tahoe Reno Pulp. I mean, I know that's located here, but Tahoe Reno Pulp Pop, <laughs> Pop Culture Con. And my understanding is, is they are going to go through the entire country. So I haven't looked into that. It's called Pop Culture and it's all education. Um, but again, I don't have a relationship with them. Um, on one called SDE that has come to me, and I'm sorry, I can't look up that acronym right now. Um, and I'm finding a lot, of, um, a lot of open arms to mental health. And my background, I don't have an education degree. My background is in the arts. So I'm getting accepted into these by proposing in a certain way, you know, just saying I'm good at what I'm good at, or saying, listen, this is an enhancement tool to your content. Um, without them thinking, and I'm coming in with these continuing education to support their actual content, 
I can come in to support the actual skill around speaking to their content. And I think wording it that way has opened up a lot more doors for me. That's great. Kitan, is it Kitan? Yeah, Kathan, yeah, from the UK. Hi. Um, I just wanted to share a little story. I am originally from India. So uh, when I was in India last year, I went to uh, underprivileged school um, and did some improv there. And actually where this kind of took off is for people with you know, underprivileged backgrounds, developing countries. Um, it, it, it took a little bit of time for people to get warmed up and use improv because often in that kind of situation, they're taught that there's only one answer. So they're thinking, what's the answer here? But once they got into it, what's really interesting, what I found really interesting is that it really opened up the options for them in terms of how they could progress in their life. And so that's something I'm looking to do. I'm, I'm going to go to Bangalore um, in December, but that's something to think about where people are from poor backgrounds, underprivileged backgrounds, how Impro can help in being more creative about the options that they have in going forward with their life. Absolutely. I, I appreciate that perspective. That is, uh, that is very true. And I see it even with practitioners who aren't on this call. I know, for example, Gabe Mercado in the Philippines, I've done work with him and he, he's been doing that for at least 20 years going into the schools uh, and, and bringing improv in really an area where schools are very, they barely have four walls in many cases, barely. Uh, thank you. That's a, an important perspective. Um, I think, uh, you know, there was some really great, uh, this, this, this bit about education and, 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 and social work and counseling. I just think that's so important to think about the work we're doing is doesn't, or drama, it doesn't fit really in one category. And uh, I think it's really, uh, I think it's valuable to really focus and realize that. And of course, that's a challenge as well, because we don't fit in one perfect category. Uh, we have to kind of carve out how we get in into the schools. It's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, yeah, Ed, this is our time. This is all of our times. I think the world is almost ready for this. But I really, because I'm starting to get more and more my phone ringing and not me ringing other people's phones. And it's such, it's such a beautiful thing. Um, I had something brilliant to say and I forgot it. <laughs> Go well, on. That's, that's, that's okay. Only because I saw Megan do it. So I'm going to bring my dog <laughs> into the frame too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I saw oh, it. I think okay. this was the brilliant thing. Well, we, well, we pet puppies. I think this was the brilliant thing. This is just coming from a place of, of the deep, deep, deep down inside my heart and where I come from and the struggles that I had as a youth. Because yeah. I try to explain if we go back out of the mental health, but using mental health and into the schools, is what this allows you to do. I mean, we, I was talking earlier about attaching it to language, attaching it to core content, SEL and all that kind of stuff. But front loading it with the folks going, listen, this is going to clear space to create those authentic relationships so the kids can actually learn. And that's, you know, that's what comes from a place in my heart. I was so confused, so terrified, so scared, didn't feel safe in school. I didn't learn anything. I didn't learn anything until about maybe my final two years of high school. You know, I was just so compromised that I go into these different districts. I've got a district up here we work in where kids are literally pooping in their, excuse my language, but they're pooping in their sinks at home. There's no running water. They're hungry. They're scared. Their parents are doing drugs. They get into the school and it's like, here's math. And, you know, so in that school district, we're designing these five minutes, three times a day, circle games, you know, it might just be a ball toss game or something of that nature where there's some laughter connection, what's going on, you know, um, just to feel safe in that environment. So now you can teach me math. Don't teach me math when I'm afraid and hungry. So that's, I feel, is a really important thing. And then again, that speaks to that trauma-informed, you know, we can become an enhancement tool to all these strategies of trauma-informed. I think well, that's, oh, Nancy, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, you, you were speaking earlier about um, telling that story. And I think it's really 
exciting to hear you frame it in that way because the the science base is very clear that that connection and you called it sort of the aut fiercely authentic or something earlier which was really lovely but there's literature to support that those are critical prerequisites for learning and so if we already know that the connection has been demonstrated as a critical prerequisite for learning, then our job is just to come in and show that our tools can lead to that connection. And so, you know, it's almost as if, you know, the analogy to the medical field, you know, we can show that, that a certain vitamin or drug or something affects you know, heart disease. And then it's our job to come in and make sure people are compliant with that drug or vitamin or lifestyle modification. It's not our job to, you know, figure out the whole causal pathway because the evidence exists for a lot of that. It's our job just to come in and say, hey, you're looking for a way to develop connection. We got a tool for you. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, I think that's a really important point too. Uh, and self-care, I, I think it would be, I would be unfair not to mention, I think we, we as facilitators and practitioners, wherever, wherever, we're, wherever we're going in the schools or uh, whatever setting, I think we have to also self-care because I think that's a potential mm -hmm. we could, we as individuals can burn out to as well very quickly. Use the bathroom. <laughs> Make sure you have time for the restroom. You know, in Japan, and someone tell me if I'm wrong, is in Japan, I do believe the first two years of primary is set up on the Marzano kind of thing of self-actualization. So the kids, I believe pre-K and kindergarten don't even learn any core content or maybe it's through first grade and they're in their environments just to learn how to socially connect and to feel safe in school then it might be second or third grade, I'm not sure, where they start teaching them and they're seeing great um, results in this. The kids are engaged, you know, they feel that family connection in the room. I can't imagine why that wouldn't be a good idea in all atmospheres, but I don't know as much, much more about that. It just sounds very splendid. Mm -hmm. uh, I am going to, just as a, another resource, uh, click in here. It's a local group to my city, but I'm sure they're affiliated. It's a it's a organization that really does a lot of work around trauma, you know, care and trauma informed teaching. Um, and and I know I took a small short course just to so I was prepared to go into those settings that we've been talking about, uh, where we might be around you know students that are dealing with a lot. So uh, and it changed the way I teach. Uh, I will say this one last nugget. You know, I used to always immediately close a door when I would begin, you know, a session. And, and now I sort of like really uh, think about that because closing a door, a simple door could really uh, trigger, you know, half the students in a room. So getting that permission, little, little things like that I learned. Little things like that, like announcing it, asking, getting a sort of thought and, and not a consensus because sometimes you have to really, uh, you know, look at the individual, the one out of 15 that may really uh, panic if you close that door. So, so it really it made me adjust and I really, that's that kind of a trauma that we're all speaking to, really thinking about how we're, how we're facilitating. Oh, Amy, did you have your hand up, Amy, or no? Okay, I said, well, we're at the last couple of minutes. This has been a home stretch, uh, great conversation. Uh, I hope it was helpful. Uh, I know some people had to drop off because they had meetings, but uh, this is a great start. Uh, there is an, uh, on the AIN uh, board, there is an official uh, education committee, uh, sort of, and it's more education around the resources, really for applied improv, not necessarily like just strictly going into schools, but really, and I think a lot of these resources, it's going to be shared. I'm going to definitely copy and paste everything in the chat so that we have all these uh, links and, and different resources. Um, and so this will be shared and when it goes up, share the video widely too as well. So people could, uh, that missed it can hear it. Anything final closing thoughts from any, anybody? Can, can you repeat, did you just say that on the main applied improv network page, uh -huh. not the Facebook page on the website, there's a teaching resource there? Well, the education sort of committee that runs it uses, I think, the resource tab. You're right. Oh, the resource tab. I get it. Yep. I'm yep. okay. but, the, but the people that r sort of run that 
committee that that curate all that that help with that uh, need to do obviously we're doing more of this and this is sort of this will fit in that bucket as a resource okay perfect this is awesome great yes well I I think we're at a really good uh, you know closing point I just really appreciate everyone's time uh, I know time is you know I would say money is is nice but time is really, you can't get that back. So, so thank you for the time we all spent together and your information and resources. Uh, and uh, I don't know, and do you want to have any, Christiane, you want to have any closing words? No, I just, I hope I could answer a couple of questions or at least, you know, get some ideas going. I am going to say I, I learned a ton from every single person on here. So I appreciate that as well. A great give and take. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you. Oh, we need to take a picture, Ed. I took like oh. a, do a dozen. My so, mouth open? <laughs> not okay. I, what's that? I, I did. I took a dozen just because it's nice to have it archived, you know. Uh, thank you, everybody. And what time is it in UK right now? What time do you have there? Uh, it's 5.25. In the morning or, or at night? No, no, in the afternoon. Oh, oh, good. Okay. Uh, these these meetings, I think they're more, mainly at four 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 p.m. are perfect. I, well, thanks to <laughs> me, Paul. Me. Thanks, <laughs> thanks to Paul, who's not here, but you know, watch this. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Maybe super convenient for London. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen, everyone, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank wow. you, Christiana. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. And I think Catherine's still on there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.